Hey, I'm R. Alan Brooks. I am the host of this podcast. And I am Dale Johnson. I am editor and producer. So he does all the hard grunt work. Uh, so this episode is Leo Castaneda. He's a, a Colombian a video game developer and artist. And, you know, I got to say for myself with video games, like I've kind of been in and out of them my whole life. But the reason... The last one I got addicted to was Grand Theft Auto. Yeah. The reason that I don't get too deep into them is because when I play a video game, I am consumed by it. Like, I have to beat it with every character. Mm -hmm. I have to go through every scenario. And I spend months on it. And at the end, I have nothing to show but hurt thumbs. <laughs> so I try to keep it to, like, uh, Tetris because it's finite. Sure, <laughs> you know? sure. You're, you're not playing the, the games that are, you know, so many are online now. And you're playing yeah. with other people. You're mic'd up. You're you're yeah. talking trash. You're strategizing. You would, never got deep into that that level. I would never it. write anything if, 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 if I did that, <laughs> you know. That would like, really be my whole life. But if, yeah. But so, like, as somebody who... Uh, only occasionally engages with video games it's really dope to hear how uh somebody's journey as a creator like mm -hmm. how they got into it how um they found their way how did they even learn like the technical aspects of it like um yes yeah, it's, it's fascinating kind of you know just to hear what his journey was in that world and uh, as somebody who's creating his own game yeah, yeah. And, you know, I thought there were a lot of parallels between the both of you as creators, being independent, being self-taught, um, and pursuing your passions uh, on your own terms. Yeah. So uh, his game is on Steam. Yeah, or it will be releasing okay. on, it'll be rolling out on Steam soon. There might be like a beta version that, that's playable right now. Uh, it's called Levels and Bosses, um, post-apocalyptic sort of world. Uh, some puzzle solving, some you know, general exploration of of a landscape that that he's created. Yeah, it looks pretty good. So I mean, you can see like the previews of it and stuff like that. Yeah. So anyway, uh, I think you guys will dig this interview. Uh, remember, please to share, tell people about this podcast. Uh, we work hard on it. We would like more people to listen to it, and uh, you know, subscribe on YouTube or wherever you know wherever you get your podcast to. There's the video version, there's the podcast version. Subscribe in all the places, do all the things, write reviews. Thank you, and uh, enjoy it. Welcome to How Art is Born, a podcast from the Museum of Contemporary Art Denver about the origins of artists and their creative and artistic practices. I'm your host, R. Alan Brooks, artist, writer, and professor. Today I'm joined by a Miami-based video game director and multimedia artist, Leo Castaneda. Say hello. Hello, I'm C.A. Denver, and hello, Alan. Thank you for having me. <laughs> oh, no problem. I appreciate you being here. So, uh, start off, can you tell us a little bit about who you are, what you do? Um, yeah, so uh, I was originally born in Colombia, in Cali, Colombia, uh, and to a family of artists, uh, and so I grew up around this kind of uh, Latin American surrealism and abstraction, but at the same time, uh, the global media of games and anime mm. to a certain extent comics uh but not as much as you definitely but like, games is more uh my thing um but uh yeah the, basically that that catalyzed like all the work that that i've, that I've been doing the kind of upbringing where i then let my parents like couldn't find work in colombia we, en we ended up moving to the states uh um, eventually, I went to like an art high school in Miami. Um, hmm. Eventually, to college in, in New York to Cooper Union on a crossroads that I could have ended up at uh, going to college more for entertainment design. Like I was kind of in the crossroads of like fine art and and yeah. uh, entertainment design to draw for movies and video games. Uh, and I ended up going. Well, let me oh. let me bring you back just a little bit. So you're talking about your uh, you grew up in a family of artists. Yeah. Uh, you said. Oh, so were they all painters? Because you mentioned abstract and uh, uh, like what kind of art? Uh, yeah, they, they were mostly, well, yeah, my grandmother would do like these Amazonian abstract paintings. And huh. my parents met in architecture school, but they, my mom would, would like to, she was more like a, into fashion and character design. So she would do more like illustrations and ink drawings. Okay. And my dad was more into abstract painting uh with huh. architecture so yeah it was, it was kind of interesting because i kind of felt a little bit like it was like i at some point felt like i was not necessarily pushed into it but like highly 
encouraged in a <laughs> in, in a way the the my identity kind of felt uh, constructed to a certain extent uh, huh. through that. But uh, but but yeah, I think if it wasn't that's an interesting. It's an interesting thing. I want to. Uh, I guess I want to hear a little more about when you said your identity was constructed. Do you feel like it was like strongly influenced by your family having all that art? Or was it something where you went down a path and had to decide if it was really you? Yeah, yeah, the second one. Uh, because yeah. because at the same time, I always enjoyed doing art. Like since I was a little kid, like I would draw on my dad's lap. Like I, I, actually, the first memory that I have of art making is being in my dad's lap and and telling him like draw huh. ba- draw Batman, and he would draw oh, Batman, cool. and I'd be like draw Batman again, and he would draw it huh. again, and it's like draw it again. And then, and then I'd be like, uh, and then I would try, and I would get uh, kind of frustrated that at age three I wasn't like at his level. But, <laughs> but yeah, but um, but yeah, I guess tend to like not get too caught up in like everyone has a childhood, but like and not get too caught up in it. But if it's okay, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I think uh, when I was in college, I found myself like everyone going through an artist block in a, in the fine art school, like kind of being in a situation of almost overthinking art. And like, because uh, like, the school that I went to, uh, uh, it's called Cooper Union in New York. Like it was a really good school, but it was uh, a place where, well, that definitely it was more conceptual, which was, hmm. was, which was good for me to learn. And I really value it. But sometimes people would, like you would have to, show your work and almost emotively <laughs> emotively create it and be uh, ready for them to explain it in all its conceptual layers the next day which i thought was a little right. challenging uh, so for me to be able to bring back the fun aspect or like the enjoyment that i felt let's say from ages three to 17 and in, in art making yeah that, that's when i started bringing in the the concepts of video games and like world building into into the work like around my third mm-hmm. year of school to to kind of feel like like fuse the concepts of fine art uh, with yeah. with the idea of like conceptual of concept art in games where you create uh uh characters and worlds which is very similar to comics like you you basically right. have like a like a f- kind of a written foundation and then or like image foundation and then you kind of start like combining things uh, so it's interesting uh just to hear about how um you had this pure love of art from you said uh, age three to age 17 then when you uh sort of pursued the academic portions of it it carried you a bit away from the things that you enjoy mm-hmm. and you had to like find your way back to it mm-hmm. um i'm you know i i'm certain you're not the only person who went through that so mm-hmm. I just wonder at that point where you were questioning whether art was your idea, whether it's something you wanted to do, how you, I guess how you bridged that gap. You know, you said you started to reach into like the conceptual video game stuff that you liked. Um, but how, can you talk a little bit more about what that process was and how you found your way back to that? Um, yeah, yeah. So I, I made some paintings. I kind of find myself uh, doing some paintings that were fusing abstract painting with like optical illusions uh, to a certain oh. extent, like and and and, uh, and the, the first of those I called just uh, red versus blue, which was just okay. uh, uh, yeah, kind of thinking of like Halo games of or like the wars and video games. So it's like this uh, this uh, situation where you, you have these two sides that are not really questioning why they're against each other and they're just kind of. <laughs> Hmm. just uh out to destroy each other basically and so i made a painting that, that looked kind of like that it almost looked like like it's almost like mutually assured destruction style meets uh of like missile <laughs> barrage meets dragon ball like kamehameha okay. against kamehameha just like <laughs> <laughs> right. and, and and when i did that painting i was like hmm, okay that this was fun it was like that was like a childhood drawing of of, I don't know, some kind of scenario with characters battling meets yeah. my now New York art school education, uh, uh, plus yeah, some of the abstraction that I grew up around, and like, and also like the 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 abstract paintings where when you're 
be really using the brush and like really moving like that also felt like a really nice like active experience so huh. I, I did that piece but then that piece became a, a artistic dead end after that like do i make just a series that is different ways of continuing huh. that and then uh, i also did then another piece where i was thinking okay maybe let's think about video games as a starting point but uh or so i put speakers behind a painting and made okay. some sound uh actually i used the the composition of like uh, sonic the hedgehog style games where you have the, the yeah. 2d side scroller composition and right and with the sound you would guide the eye around the piece um huh. so that was another experiment but then i thought like oh okay well this is like do i just do you know 1990s 1980s 2d side scrollers with sound <laughs> like how can i have more yeah. freedom to to like really not feel constricted by a formula but just be able to world build and uh you know yeah enhance ideas of what gaming could be and also what art could be for myself but not feel the pressure of having to figure it out in the moment right so where it finally catalyzed the work that i'm still doing now so it's been since 2009 so like 14 okay, years okay so you were still in school at that point when you were doing those paintings yeah is that right yeah uh so how did uh how did your teachers how did the program react because that is a definite change from what you were doing before right yeah the, the, there were uh, there was skept skepticism there was a sense that video games were not really art at the moment so right. was, but there was some encouragement like uh, I, I did yeah so when the when the when the series actually catalyzed it was more using the structure of world building and games so like the levels okay. and bosses progression of being in one level and then you have a uh, personified version of that level as a boss and then that would right. lead to another level to another level like that that's when I, I realized like okay that can lead to almost endless art creation uh but some of the first paintings that, that i did in that scenario but almost like tight i would write the letters at, at the bottom like level one or something and, <laughs> and then i would get some nice. criticism that it would be like too too defining of what the piece would be or why hmm. what, why am i looking at video games and not other forms of like digital culture like what, what about video games is so interesting if there's if there uh there was almost a sense that even if there would be let's say cory archangel or different artists out there in the world that had reference games already mm -hmm. that there was a sense that it was a yeah like a, a lower art form or something right um but oh well, yeah comic books have had that yeah. going on for years yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah which is funny because then it gets uh, co-opted by fine art as like oh, we discovered it finally <laughs> right right at some point but um but yeah and, and that is uh yeah they zoom through the through the journey of uh, insisting and insisting on on that work uh yeah nowadays it's become much more accepted within the fine art world and and uh and the independent video games have grown up also a ton. Hmm. I gotta say it's really interesting because uh, bringing in video games help you rediscover what you liked about art, which is really cool. Mm -hmm. And to see that you're, you know, that you've made your way to a profession in video games. Um, first of all, that's just that's cool. I, I like to hear like um, what was that journey from. Uh, making a series of paintings to finding your way to working within the video game industry. Um, yes. So, so basically, um, by the time I was in my senior year of college, I, I started thinking of like the active viewership potential of games with more in art installation. So I did, hmm. and I had zero digital skills except for Photoshop and illustrating. So I did, uh, some sculptures where you, uh, like, like inspired by arcade machines and I was excited about that started doing some also like more performance type works where I would create costumes of the characters that I was creating and have friends mm. do different performances uh nice and then my best friend in uh Cooper Union was actually a, a, a comic book artist uh so he started an indie publishing company and he challenged mm. me to turn the paintings of the first level into a narrative uh okay. yeah so so then i got 
10 paintings, kind of put them together. Like, you know, he gave me a Scott McCloud understanding comics and gave me, right. and gave me like some tips on how to do a sequential narrative. And, and, and then I was like, Oh, wow, this is like doing the, the storyboard for, for a story. Is it going to be a performance one day, like an opera or something, or, or maybe it could be a video game one day, but, hmm. but then I had zero digital skills. So I, uh, or like digital, like 3D creation skills. So it took me a couple of years when I, when I was like, okay, well, maybe one day, you know, I could save up to work with a programmer or, or, and then, and then I just thought, okay, let me just download the software and go on YouTube and start learning uh, a couple yeah. years later. Uh, and then, yeah, like 2013, I started just learning through the internet, through forums. Uh, I started working with Unity first. Uh, which was free, but then the Unreal Engine became free in mm. 2013 as well. And Unreal didn't have the limitation of n knowing how to code in the traditional sense with the with the lines. Like there was a system okay. called uh, Blueprints. Hmm. So I basically started le learning le learning how to do that. Started translating the paintings and the and the worlds into into the 3D environments. Um, Started also just learning the tools and creating like virtual reality experiments mm -hmm. uh, um, as part of the world building and also just as part of the learning process of, of using the, because VR is done with the same programs. Right. And uh, integrating VR headsets into sculptures as, as an extension of the kind of like arcade machines meet the uh, art installations. And then over time, eventually, let's say if the comic book was or like the 10 page graphic novel uh, uh, storyboard of the first level was 2011. It took me until 2018 to have the skills to start creating that level digitally. Wow. And, uh, and then, but then by then I was still like, I was like, okay, well, to be able to actually program a whole ability system and, and an actual game, I can't do it alone. So I started applying to grants. Uh, yeah. uh, locally, with uh, I had moved back to Miami already, but I started applying to grants and you know lots of rejections. But then eventually, some started coming in uh, to to work with programmers and asking around and and eventually uh, skipping ahead to where I'm, I'm at now. Like over time, uh, just through through friend references and and uh, you know eventually, like I mean. It's not like I have like a big team right now. It's, it's three, three core members, including myself. Uh, one programmer right. that's in Colombia. My partner that's a producer on the game, and uh, but then but then it's like maybe seven others, including two sound designers and another programmer. Uh, uh, anyways, that's really it, cool. Yeah, so it, it grew over time thanks to arts grants. And, and I also taught at a, at a university for three years and saved half my salary for it. So uh, yeah, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, but it's definitely not, 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 not easy. Uh, and it's taken a long time to learn, but, but I feel like it's a rewarding experience uh, overall. And, yeah. I love hearing about that, man. I, you know, I mean, you're talking about the small team. I was thinking, I read uh, for everything, everywhere, all at once, the effects team was four people. Wow. You know, yeah, right. And, and so, you know, I think um, we're at this interesting place where, of course, we have, you know, AI knocking at our door for everything we create artistically, but we also have um, the technology where very small teams can accomplish really big things. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it gives an interesting place for some stories that haven't been told to be told. So, I, so I'm excited about that aspect of things. Yeah. Um, yeah. But so with oh what were you gonna say oh just uh that if the technology was not where it's at now in terms of a free game engine i mean free after and then you pay them five percent after one million dollars like if it wasn't for yeah. unreal engine existing as a free software like 20 years ago uh, independent game designers would have to create their own engine uh, but yeah yeah so you would need to invest thousands to hundreds of thousands of dollars just to have the structure mm -hmm. that would be able to house the, wow. the technology. And now they just, you know, it's like much more open source. Right. 
Mm-hmm. Well, it's an interesting thing, man, because you know, uh, even though I'm not a dedicated video gamer, um, the world of comics and and video games are so parallel mm-hmm. that I, you know, I end up hearing like some of the things of how things work, the, the crafting of stories and stuff like that. But I think um, for people who are listening, it would be interesting to talk about the process of making a game um, for you, like from beginning to end. Like, do you start with story? Do you start with kind of a concept? Like, um, yeah, what's what's it like? Um, yeah, well, for me, I kind of start with the intention and, and that intention, well, first was, yeah, combining fine art and games and the concepts of fine art and games. Uh, concepts and aesthetics and then if one goes deeper into that then you know there's philosophies there's yeah. like you know surrealism abstraction there's a whole mixture of things and then over time that intention was also at some point i'll grow up to the point that i can say something that's deeper about what interactivity and games could evolve to but, but yeah when i started it at yeah 20 or 21 years old i was not at, at that point but i think over time, the more games I played and the more I lived and, and the more I met people to collaborate with, the more the intention of the game is to to go. I mean, also, and also the intention of the game was to challenge what a level and a boss would be, like like the, the yeah. hierarchical systems of game of, right. of games and like the the structure of antagonism of games. So huh. so with uh, with that in mind. Uh, it's basically a process of doing drawings with that intention of also worlds where where uh, sentience is shared across landscapes, technology, and beings. So like where yeah. it's almost like animistic worlds. Um, so with that in mind, like re- reimagining the hierarchical and antagonism structure of games and having worlds that are interconnected, the and having the aesthetics that are merging like surrealism and abstraction and allowing myself to kind of have the freedom of creating whatever I want. <laughs> right. and, and, also, and that oscillates. There, it's not always in freedom mode. Sometimes yeah, we, we create our own structures uh, that, that contain endless exploration of artistic development. But with, with that in mind, it's basically letting myself draw and paint freely to kind of mm-hmm. catalyze the world building mm-hmm. and then uh, get, getting that and then continuing in Unreal or Maya Mudbox and doing the 3D models, sometimes using the, the textures from those models, sorry, from the paintings and drawings into the 3D. So it's like a very, very much a feedback loop that starts mm-hmm. uh, generating from the digital to analog process. And yeah, and uh, and then um so yeah that's that aspect and now with the with the team uh, uh i'll meet with a programmer once a week and then we'll talk about the interaction aspect so it's like so, so a lot of the drawings are also uh, mapping out what the interactions would be i'll talk about it, that with the programmer uh mm-hmm. he'll do the base and he'll leave it with connections for me to do the animations and the visual effects on top and and I'll do the simple programming or simpler programming that connects to his most more complex programming. And anyways, okay. that's, that's kind of like the, so, the loop. Yeah. So to, just to uh, make sure, like you know, I, tell me if I get it right. But the programming seems to. Uh, so you start with the concepts. You have all the art. You come to the programmer. They uh, provide sort of a technological structure for the game to work. Yeah. And then you're adding back in all the aesthetic portions. Is that right? Yeah, the aesthetic portions and then the, it's, it's almost like, like if you're in your house and there's, the programmer is almost doing the, all the back end electrical work, uh, but I still have to design what the, what the outlet or the switch looks like, uh, yeah. looks like and what the lamp looks like and 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 know how to do the <laughs> the electrical <laughs> aspect to connect right. to the electricity. <laughs> so so so, okay. so but, but yeah, but the for example, the, the hardest thing in the, to do in the game that was way out of my league was a ability system. Like Unreal Engine has an innate ability system. And in video games you have you have that a lot, like especially uh, role playing games. 
where you have a character progression and different items and different right. uh, abilities that build up over time. And, and, and that, that's been something that, that, uh, that, yeah, I had thought about for a while, but then w- once through the DIY, just working alone, uh, once I hit the ability system, I was like, okay, <laughs> I, can't, I can't do this alone. Uh, and, and also I think it's such a place for exploration of what a game could be. Uh, for example, right. like the, the main abilities uh, that we're working with, or, or some of the main abilities include uh, camouflage, um, uh, laser-based communication, and electromagnetic sensors, um, hmm. s- switching of, of embodiments. So, so anyways, like the, the beings in this uh, universe that could be an alien universe or like a post-human universe, it's kind of open-ended that they're constantly using light and vibration and in and, and different ways to, to adapt to the landscape and, and they don't even eat they, they use uh they harness kinetic energy from the landscape to oh. to in a mutualistic way to be able to kind of to to um yeah to be able to regenerate and and, and that's another of the concepts of the game like how to create a a, a game system that is non-destructive but that allows for destruction as a because there's a choice of it but it makes mm-hmm. it way less effective than a mutualistic or uh, sustainable interaction so that's the, that's been yeah. another of the aspects that's been really cool to grow over time it's and and and, and with that too uh, my partner lauren is a was a writer and cultural organizer uh, okay and, and and film producer it's been really great to to work with her because she's always thinking of how like organizing systems work so it's been it's been cool oh, like cool. to like be able to talk to her every day and uh, anyways and to have yeah. her as part of the project as well okay so we go design then programming and then the next step is the step you just described where you are figuring out these problems mm-hmm. and uh adding all the aesthetics so then after that is it done or, or what's the next steps? <laughs> uh, to play tests uh, and wow. b- because of, uh, you know, kind of the project growing up through the art world or through uh, art exhibitions, art exhibitions have been really good for play testing. Uh, so they kind of provide deadlines and, and, and then uh, a bunch of people get to try the game. Uh, right. You know, yeah, even if it's in process, like it's been really good to get uh, to get feedback in that way, and uh, and then uh, re- reiterating, like it's. I mean, there, there's a. I can send you a link later, but there's a there's a short game that I that I made uh, through a museum in Colombia and a game jam, like in a way that it's online. But the the main game levels and bosses is still to be released uh, next year and on Steam and. So, so I've, I've never actually experienced the feeling of just launching something out oh. there to like what? thousands of people. Uh, Is but, that short one something that people can go play now? Uh, yeah, yeah, it's in Spanish, but but yeah, it's, yeah. It, it's, it's playable on itch.io. It's it's basically it's called Jardín Oculto, uh, Estación Jardín Oculto, which just means like gestation, hidden garden. Even though hidden oh. garden sounds better in Spanish. <laughs> <But> <laughs> But uh, but it's basically uh, almost like a it's in the levels and bosses universe of like these kind of sentient sculptures almost uh, where huh. you have the you pilot a, a drone that that can collect water and light and then you build a sculpture right. garden like by just finding huh. seeds and then you build up this garden of sculptures and and at first it, it feels great like you're just uh, uh, yeah, building your garden, but then if you overbuild, it becomes a lot of management because you, uh, you end up with like twenty sculptures that, that are always asking. Eventually, they're all asking for water and for light. <laughs> Anyways, uh, well, uh, if you uh, uh, if you send a link to it, uh, I'm sure Daily will can include it in the notes for the episode, so people who are listening can check it out if they want to. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah I'll definitely okay. do that. Yeah, yeah, and we just launched uh, last week the Steam page for levels and bosses that will will release episodically starting next year so nice that, that'll be cool to get some feedback on cool yeah okay so uh 
what you're working on presently is is not an extension of that game? Is it is something else? Is that right? Uh, no, no, it's still the. It's oh, not it's, the bosses. Yeah, yeah. I mean the okay. the the gardening game was in the same universe. Like it's there. Oh, I it, see. It shares aesthetics. Uh, uh, but it, but in the level of the bosses universe, there's definitely the ability to to like switch bodies and to drones or sculptures huh. and different things like that. So it's almost like if you have a yeah. And when I say drone, it doesn't look like the you know, you know four helicopters or something. It's, it huh. looks more like like um, because another of the abilities in the main game that's key is uh, the ability of using touch. With different intensities so okay and and touch uh that has that creates a vibrational field around the hand or the hand the appendage that is the hand and that can be intensified or or you know be intensified or just uh, the, the the base version so there's in that other game there's a drone the, the drone sculpture is almost like just the head and the arm but, and so it's like a little floating head arm drum <laughs> okay yeah uh do you feel like uh you know I, it's interesting because you've been talking about combining the sensibilities of fine art with the the video game stuff so um i don't know i mean where you are in the process right now are you happy with how those things are melding is it is it challenging to keep that kind of that blend going what's that like um yeah, I'm overall happy with how it's going, but it uh, has been a situation that, well, I had a solo show last year at a place called Locus Projects here in Miami, and uh, it was a really good uh, kind of showcase of what it could be like to do a multimedia experience with, like, I designed uh, gaming chairs and wallpapers and tapestries, and everything was kind of com- combining the, the aesthetics of a game conference booth and an art installation and, and I showed the concept art for the game and paintings. Anyways, it was all the media. All the media, but the only thing, the main thing that I learned there is that the game itself kind of suffered because I was too scattered of like working on eight different artworks at the same time. <laughs> it, and, and eight could be even more. And even though I had help you know, with sound design, like I didn't do this, I, I, collaborated with others in that aspect and anyways people, I was able to use the grants to have people help me but um, but it still felt like the game suffered so where I'm at now is just trying to minimize uh, the, the fine art exhibitions as much as possible for the next year or two and just finally get the game out there <laughs> that's yeah. that's, that, that's where I'm at right now but but but, but the, the the art exhibitions have been really great to yeah, to prototype the aesthetics, to get play testing, but but in order for the crossover, so that it's not just an art game within an art context, which you know you have uh, different situations within art exhibition context where you yeah you put a let's say well a lot of that is like relational aesthetics like like this artist re- recruits her of Anisha, like like cooking in a, in a gallery or doing, mm-hmm. you know, playing tennis in a gallery, like, you know, th- those kind of situations are, are almost commenting or, or let's say even with comics, like there's artists that would do art as a comic for a gallery, a museum or, or uh, right. art influenced by comics uh, in a museum. But I don't, my, my goal is not to have it be something that stays in the museum because the, Hmm. Or, or the art gallery and it's expensive like, i feel like the, the accessibility of independent video games is something that's uh zero to twenty dollars and can be uh right can be afforded by people all over the world is something that uh yeah it encourages me to try to get the game out there in, in that format instead of only within hmm. the insular uh, structures of fine art. So yeah. yeah, that's a cool vision, man. Okay, I want to ask um, about fear. So in your process, when you're creating, what is it like when you feel fear, and how do you find your way t- forward? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I, I mean, 
the getting the game out there is definitely the, the biggest fear and will it get completed is the biggest fear. So there are two active things right. that I mentioned like 20 seconds ago that, that have not been done yet. So mm. the, I think the, yeah, and, and that I've been working on for many, many years and sometimes I'll have friends like, hey, like, when is it going to be done? Like, if you don't get it done, <laughs> it's never going right. to get done. And, and I'm like, no, but, you know, it takes a while to refine, like, better delayed than never. And I think the, yeah, that, that would probably be that and surviving as an artist are the number one fears that I have of, Let's say like the that that one exhibition that I was like all eggs in one basket in multimedia. Right. Like I, yeah, I saved up different grants and salaries and everything, and just basically put everything into it. And then it's the kind of thing that it, that after that I was like, oh my gosh, like if nothing arrives financially, like I'll have to give up on making the game or like give up on being an artist, move to my parents' house or something like. <laughs> like the, I think the, yeah, I think as an artist, like when it's constantly oscillating between these, uh, this like unstable um, income uh, situations, and I think I, I really learned to, to, to kind of be a little smarter about the budgeting of. Uh, That's key. <laughs> yeah, um, but, but yeah, so and unfortunately, there was another grant that arrived from the Knight Foundation early in their year that was able to kind of uh, stabilize me, but but also I have to be, it, it, it was a good lesson to to kind of, um, yes, yeah, grow the project, but also not forget about my own uh, health and, and yeah. survival. Yeah, so. All right, well, so when you're facing that fear, like what is, you know, how do you mobilize in it? You know, like, how do you make sure that it doesn't stop you? Um, yeah, I guess, uh, I don't know, meditation and mm. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, so yeah, meditating, breathing and, and yeah. or like art making to a certain extent, it's kind of those things that it, 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 it does, it, if it goes back to the art as a thing that is, that gives life purpose and feels good to do, not right. that is not a burden. Uh, I would much rather be doing that and have the fear of how am I gonna pay rent for you know like next month or the month after that, or that yeah. than to have the fear that I'm that time is passing by and I'm not doing art and thus like not having that experience and not and that or, and the artistic growth. I think. Because in the end, even if it's challenging, it feels very good and it's rewarding and it's and it gives a sense right. of meaning that that I yeah. That I like. So when you do art that is uh, when you do art that's supposed to renew you past fear, is it art that is outside of the project you're working on, so you can kind of like get a clean clean slate, or is it related to what you're working on? It's yeah, it's usually. 99% of the time related to what I'm working on because, oh, because the, okay. the structure of the levels situation mm -hmm. could make it so that absolutely every artwork that I make, no matter what can go back to it. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, so, cool. so it could be that let's say like right now, if I look to my right, my, my partner, she left a perfume bottle on the table. So hmm. I could be inspired by that perfume bottle uh, and, you know, like this, the setup here of just different everyday items and do a still life about them just to feel good. But then, yeah. but then if I imagine the perspective of a tiny being the size of an ant around the perfume bottle, it turns into a city or something. So, so, oh, I, so, right. I, so it could be this situation where, uh, yeah, it's almost like, yeah going back to a situation of letting go of expectation of this has to be the, the this art piece has to be part of the development of the canon and actually i really want to try to undo the situation like the, the, the ideas of what of a of a canon narrative but mm. but um but anyways the uh, and any kind of deviation and, and just having fun with something could end up going back into the main project but it could also just be you know, an experiment that 
just yeah doesn't fully work out but uh, yeah usually yeah 99 percent of the time it is it's just like moving on to to a future world that i'm not working on digitally just kind of sketching it out or or yeah or just researching on what's going on in the world and and doodling right on Okay, well, so, uh, Leo, we're going to start to wrap up. There are two questions that I ask to wrap up, but one of them is, uh, what is your geeky pleasure? What's inspiring you artistically these days? It could be another game, movies, books, music. Um, the number one thing is uh, learning about AI and being scared of it and also <laughs> excited by it. <laughs> yeah, and I feel like it's like the, imp- the coming of a the closest tangible thing to a god that we've ever experienced as a civilization mm-hmm. besides nature um and yeah and, and, I, and yeah and respecting everyone's spirituality but um uh, but yeah just the the super intelligence arriving and and how we relate to it is definitely the the main mm-hmm. thing that the both the AI of YouTube will suggest to me to look at, and mm-hmm. that I choose to 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 look into, and then yeah, that that and, and I'm always like kind of listening in the background and learning about like different games through YouTube and and uh, yeah, and how games are made, but, but yeah, but the 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 oscillating fear and optimism and what are you know thinking about like how the world's going to evolve with ai and how it's affecting artists i also teach at a at a high school slash college uh 3d animation class and just like talking to the students of, of how they're confronting ai i think is yeah it's, hmm. it's a complex situation but, no doubt yeah <laughs> all right well uh then uh, my other question is, where can people follow you, follow your stuff? Where's the best place for them to check out what you do? Um, for for my fine artwork that does mix games, I'm on my personal website uh, and Instagram. And then um, for my video game project, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we just launched a Steam page. Uh, so, uh, so Steam is the marketplace for games. So if you look up levels and bosses on Steam, you'll see the the new trailer and the description of the mm-hmm. game, and 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 you can and that uh, people can wish list it there, which is basically that uh, when it comes out episodically in about a year, um, yeah, they'll get an email and be like, hey, it's out. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah. All right. Uh, do you have anything that uh, you want to plug that you're working on? I mean, you've been talking about the game. Is there anything more specific about how people can check it out or support it? Uh, no, that will be at the, the, the Steam. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Well, Leo, I appreciate you talking to me. Um, yeah, it's been a cool conversation. It's a, it's a world that I'm always near, but not that deeply into. So it's great to hear like uh, your journey and how, how you approach putting together games and all of that thank you on uh and thank you Delhi, and thank you to mca denver and, and yeah i'm happy happy to share and there's a lot of cro- crossover with lots of uh other media yeah like yeah comics ex- exhibition design filmmaking yeah. like architecture like there's it's yeah it's like putting together a project that has a world of narrative and interactions and um, right. Yeah. So it's just a continuation of other media and it's been done before, but through a very active participation of the, the viewer. Right on. Special thank you to today's guest, Leo Castaneda. Thank you to the listeners. If you're not already, please be sure to subscribe to How Art is Born wherever you get your podcasts for more episodes. If you can, leave a review, it helps us out. Check out MCA Denver on YouTube and subscribe to the channel to watch the video version of this podcast and get behind the scenes clips from today's episode. How Art is Born is produced and edited by Dale Johnson and executive produced by Courtney Law. Additional thanks to Rachel Grammis for their work on marketing support for this episode.